This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. Streaming Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. Believe it or not, it's been three years <laughs> since we last provided an overview of the streaming services. Since then, the major players have consolidated their control, but now new players are on the, are on, on the horizon, and they got a lot of dough. And there are several markets that streaming players can vie for. Like the smorgasbord market, vast programming libraries. Award seekers, high-end original programming with a big push at award time. Cord cutters, which are suppliers of over-the-top programming from single or multiple traditional broadcaster cable channels. Niche, specific programming for tiny dedicated audiences. Not tiny midget people. Let's start with the established players. Netflix has 130 million users, or at least it counts. There's a lot of sharing going on, with 62 million in the U.S. The cost is from $9 to $16 per month, with $27 billion in 2018 revenues. They spent $13 billion on content, 85% of which was for their originals. Their markets are the smorgasbord, award seekers, and niche. So Netflix finds themselves in a race to replace their traditional programming sources, TV and movie studios, with their own original programming before the studios finish creating competing streaming services. Mm -hmm. There's also the question of what a Netflix program is. Is it a movie or is it a TV show when it comes to award time? Mm -hmm. And both industries are pushing back as Netflix encroaches on their award chances. They've done very well despite this. Black Mirror, The Crown, and Roma... We've been Netflix subscribers since the days when you got your DVDs there, but we're wavering on whether we'll remain or not, especially as new services arrive. Amazon Prime Video. Over 100 million users of Prime, but only 26 million actually use the video component. Cost is $13 a month or 119 a year, but that includes the free shipping and a lot of other stuff. Yes. <laughs> their revenues? Mmm. They spent $5 billion on content last year, and their markets are smorgasbord award seekers, court cutters, and niche through bundling options like HBO Go, Crunchyroll, etc. It's difficult to determine how much Amazon actually makes with Prime Video since it's part of a much larger Prime service. We know they're a distant number two in terms of user base and will likely remain there for some time. It's also unclear how much they make by bundling other streaming services. It can't be a lot since the other services don't charge much or any premium for it. It's more of a single bill convenience factor for users. They also push for award eligible programming to compete with Netflix, such as The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. We have Prime Video as well, but we don't heavily use it. It's really more for the free shipping. Yeah. Hulu has more than 25 million users in 2018. The cost is 6 to $12 per month. Their revenue is about $3 billion in 2019 with $1.5 billion in ads. They spent more than $2.5 billion for content in 2018. Their market is the smorgasbord, award seekers, and niche. Hulu's always been an odd duck in this race. Created as a YouTube killer by ABC, NBC, and Fox, it wound up being the place where most per broadcast TV programming goes to stream, with the exception of CBS, which we'll get to. It also competes in the award space, specifically The Handmaid's Tale. After recent transactions, Hulu is now owned 66% by Disney ABC, with 33% by Comcast, NBC, Cable Town, Shineheart, Wiggs, and the latter will likely sell out to the Mouse House. We've had Hulu for years, but we'll see what remains after corporate musical chairs comes to a stop. Then there are the up-and-comers. Mm -hmm. Acorn TV at $5 a month, about 800,000 users, and BritBox at $6.99 a month, about half a million users. Their market is niche. Two different sources for UK-centric programming. Acorn has deals with ITV, Channel 4, and BBC Worldwide, along with producers in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. BritBox is an official partnership between BBC and ITV, and the closest we'll ever get to the BBC iPlayer, only available legally in the UK. Neither includes any content you could get on BBC America. One has to wonder if both services can coexist long term. We did the Acorn TV trial, and it's decent, but not something we would keep as an ongoing service. Maybe when a new season of a show comes out, and then drop it. CBS All Access. The cost is 6 to $10 a month. 8 million users, including Showtime streaming. Their market is cord cutters. CBS was the only broadcast player that avoided Hulu, decided to go their own way, which took a long time to come to market. 
They're hanging their hat on new shows based on CBS-owned properties, along with runs of their existing broadcast shows. Star Trek Discovery supposedly pulled in a lot of people, along with The Good Fight and the just-released Twilight Zone remake. They also provide live CBS streams in many markets. CBS is mining Star Trek for a number of new all-access series. Keep in mind that All Access is U.S. only, which means these new series are ending up on Netflix elsewhere. We've sampled CBS All Access, but it's hard to justify it so far, even for us Trekkies. <laughs> DC Universe. Cost $7.99 a month, $74.99 annually. No real data so far on user base or revenues. The market is niche. Definitely. <laughs> As a longtime DC fan, see how I got my wife to read comics on SFPPN, I was so excited to see what DCU would be. It includes a selection of DC movies, DC TV archive, new original shows, and digital comics. We jumped in with an early pre-sale deal. I've enjoyed it so far, especially the original shows such as Titans and Doom Patrol. However, DC intends to sell those shows elsewhere after an initial period. There's a Titans Blu-ray coming soon, which I think is cutting themselves off at the knee. There's also recent worries that upcoming shows are being reduced in length, plus the specter of Warner Media's yet-to-be-announced service. Why would they compete against themselves? This makes DCU questionable long-term. ESPN Plus, $5 per month or $50 per year, plus $25 per month to add Major League Baseball and NHL sports. Sports, 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 blah, blah, blah. <laughs> An alternative is Fubo TV, which is basically all sports not on ESPN for $55 to $75 a month. No interest for us. Only in the Olympic season. Yeah. HBO Now slash HBO Go. Now is $15 a month. Go is included in HBO's cable cost. HBO did a terrible job in marketing these two services. So HBO Now provides a library of existing HBO properties a la Netflix. HBO Go allows you to watch regular HBO on mobile devices. It's widely assumed that most HBO Go accounts are being shared by millennials from their parents' cable subscription. We've never really gotten into HBO stuff. Pluto TV. Cost is free, with a lot of commercials. Pluto TV bundled a large group of niche channels, some available on their own sites, some curated for Pluto. I'd often watch MST3K on their dedicated channel there. The commercials are annoying, often dropped into the middle of a scene and repeated endlessly. But not bad enough that he'll watch the DVDs that he also owns. <laughs> They're also about to add a dedicated BBC channel, including classic Doctor Who. Then there's the over-the-top bundlers of existing cable channels. Hulu, with live TV, cost $45 per month, or $51 if bundled with Hulu. Add $15 to $30 per month for a network-based cloud DVR. Live TV in a few markets, plus a lot of cable channels. Direct TV Now costs $50 to $70 a month. Yeah, that includes HBO, which AT&T now owns, along with Direct TV. And in a big hit to the service, NFL Network is being dropped along with a number of other channels. AT&T has their own long-term plans for streaming, so DirecTV Now's future is unclear. Philo TV cost is $20 to $24 per month, depending upon the channel lineup. Basically, the anti-ESPN Plus with a some cable channels sans sports. It also includes an unlimited cloud DVR, shows expire in 20 days, plus a look-back function that goes back 72 hours on any channel. We tried the free trial and kept running into the same problem. There is so little to actually watch on cable. I end up watching Law & Order constantly. <laughs> PlayStation View. Cost is $45 to $80 a month, depending on the channel lineup. Local channels in some markets, plus a lot of cable channels and a cloud DVR. By the way, you don't need a PlayStation to use it. So why call it that? Worst marketing ever. Sling TV costs $25 to $40 per month plus add-on packages. Yet another group of cable channels. To get local TV, you need hardware and an antenna. We actually did this. They offered an Android TV-based Air TV box cheap, and it worked well for a while. We It provided live TV, a DVR, it, you just hook up a small hard drive to it, and some cable channels. Since it was an Android TV, you could also run Netflix, Hulu, other services through it. However, we never really watched the cable channels and dropped Sling while keeping the rest, but that's now become problematic because it seems like you can watch live TV for a few minutes and then the box randomly switches to Hulu for some reason. Mm -hmm. There's little official support for Android TV and online searches turned up zilch, so we're looking for a new option now. 
YouTube TV costs $50 per month. It's another service with locals, cable channels, and DVR. The only problem with this service was that it wouldn't run on Amazon Fire devices, a feud between Google and Amazon now apparently resolved. I keep getting offers for it every time I go into YouTube. Okay, so that's the players today. Coming soon, the media empires. Apple TV Plus cost coming fall. Mm. <laughs> Apple made a huge introduction for this service, which has been anticipated for over a year. Major stars and producers were trooped on stage. Reese Witherspoon, Jennifer Aniston, Steve Carell, J.J. Abrams, Steven Spielberg, Big Bird, and Oprah! Oprah! Apple TV Plus will go for the award-seeking market with a handful of high-budget, high-end TV shows. What wasn't announced? How much it would cost? Actual trailers for those shows? When it all launch? Maybe in the fall sometime. There's also an Apple TV Channels app coming, essentially Apple TV Plus bundling options. The hoopla over Apple TV Plus quickly dissipated after we heard the details of... Disney Plus costs $7 a month, available November 12th, Market Smorgasbord. What's included? The Marvel films, the Star Wars films, the Pixar films, the Disney Vault, Not So Fast, Song of the South, decades of Disney Channel shows, the Fox Library, and The Simpsons, thanks to their recent Fox purchase, all 30 seasons. Nat Geo programming, original series from Star Wars, Disney, Marvel. Meanwhile, all the non-family-friendly programming will go on Hulu, convenient as Disney will most likely own it outright soon. So yeah, I'm thinking Disney Plus will do well. <laughs> it will be hard for any household with kids to avoid it. I also think the planned price of Apple TV Plus just dropped. Now, there's a conspiracy theory that Apple TV Plus is fake and that Apple will just buy Disney outright, which they actually have cash on hand to do. By the way, that price is $247 billion. <laughs> <laughs> also, Disney is tops in synergy, so expect things like discounted merchandise, early movie tickets, deals in the parks, exclusive events like red carpet premieres. Now... There's also rumored services from Warner Media and Comcast, neither of which have announced much. But you can keep your eye open for them, and we will tell you about them. Meanwhile, you can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Way Treat Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. <laughs>